California school teacher, the mother of six children, was kidnapped some time ago by five drug addicts. She was stabbed 20 times in the back. Her captors told the police that they were warlocks, that is, male witches, and that they were devil worshipers. In Montana, some time ago, a 22-year-old social worker picked up a hitchhiker near Yellowstone National Park, and the hitchhiker then shoots his victim in the head, brutally attacks the dead body, and tells the police that he worships the devil. In Miami Beach, a 69-year-old retired woman is viciously attacked by a young woman who later tells reporters very happily that for the last five years, she has been worshiping Satan, and this is her sacrifice to the devil. Story after story after story like that could be told tonight if we only had time to tell it. The scripture has a great deal to say about the devil and demons. In fact, the whole Bible is the story of a conflict between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. And the scripture I would like for you to turn to is Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, two verses, the 10th and 11th verses of Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter of mediums, or a wizard. You remember the story of Saul. He broke that law of God. He had lost contact with God. God had left him. No more blessing upon Saul, the great king of Israel. And so he decided that he was going to consult a medium and try to get a message from Samuel. He consulted the medium. He was successful in talking briefly with Samuel, but he was killed shortly thereafter as the judgment of God fell upon Saul and his family. Now, Americans at this hour are vacillating, according to the latest polls, some deny the existence of the devil altogether, but others have an unnatural fascination with the devil and with demons and with exorcism and other things in the occult. And because of the success of the exorcist and many new films are being made on the subject of the devil and evil right now, a pastor who saw one of these films said recently, it was obnoxious, repulsive, disgusting, pornographic, and obscene. I myself have not seen any of these films. I do not intend to expose myself to this type of thing. But a Jesuit priest who saw one... But a Jesuit priest who saw one of these films said in his survey among university students, most students that have seen the films wish they'd never seen them. Now, this is not a phenomenon just in America. It's also in Germany, where there are thousands of witches. It's also in Great Britain. A British bishop said the other day that Great Britain is turning to black magic as their interest in Christianity declines. And I believe that one of the problems in the world today that is not recognized is the great intensification and acceleration of evil in the world at this moment because the devil knows his time is short. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ may be drawing near. And the scripture teaches that as the coming of the Lord draws near, the activity of the devil will intensify. The kidnapping, the violence, the terror all over the world, I believe, is a part of demonic activity. One authority says that witchcraft is growing faster than any other religion in the Western world. And one reason I think that young people get involved is because it does get them involved. It's a return to nature, in a sense, a worship of the natural gods, finding some power within themselves are broadening their minds, some of them through drugs and some without drugs. But thousands of young and old alike are dabbling 
in the occult at this moment. Shops in our cities are selling all types of things that go along with the occult. One university professor, not this university, but a university professor said some time ago that there were dozens of covens on their campus. Now, a coven, as you know, is a circle of witches and warlocks, and warlocks are male witches, numbering 13. They always number 13. And they have their rites and their rituals and their literature and their witchcraft. Now, what is right and what is wrong? What is false and what is true? The Bible has a lot to say about it, and I'm going to cover a big subject in a very few minutes tonight. First, the Bible teaches there is a devil. There is a devil. We meet him in the third chapter of Genesis, and we don't get rid of him till the end of the book of Revelation. He's all the way through the Bible. And in the Bible, we find that he's a person. He walks, he talks, he tempts, he lies, he flatters, he kills, he works miracles, he counterfeits, he oppresses, he afflicts, he influences, he destroys, he quotes and misquotes scripture, he possesses, he inflicts bodily injury, he sows discord in the church, he spreads false doctrine. Those are the things that this personality in the Bible called the devil does according to the scripture. Now he's called in the Bible, he's called Satan. He's called the devil. He's called a fallen angel. He's called a roaring lion. He's called the prince of demons. He's called a wolf, a prowler, Beelzebub, the dragon, the serpent, Lucifer, a great light, a star, a betrayer, an adversary, a wonder worker, a liar, the father of lies, the god of this world, the prince of this world, and the prince of the, and power of the air. His is described in the Bible as the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of unrighteousness, the kingdom of hatred, sin, death, hell, and the grave. He produces false miracles, false spiritual experiences, false tongues, the father of fakery. He has a false church, a false gospel, a false plan of salvation, a false trinity, false preachers, false prophets. That's what the Bible says about the devil. Now, the word Lucifer means light bearer one who shines it's a deceptive light it's not the true light it's a deceptive light it's a false light he promises freedom liberty and life but he produces only sorrow slavery and death he's a deceiver and he's trying to deceive thousands of you young people tonight by promising you that if you'll only follow him and serve him and bow down to him and live for him, that he will give you freedom, liberty, and life. But actually, he gives you sorrow, slavery, and ultimately eternal death and hell. Now, the devil is resisted in the Bible by the characters of the Bible that God honored and blessed and loved. He was resisted by Job. He was resisted by Jesus. He was resisted by the disciples. He was cast out of heaven. And the Bible says he will eventually and ultimately be cast into hell, the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now you say, how did the devil originate? Why, why did God allow the devil? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. The Apostle Paul calls evil the mystery of iniquity. There are just some things we don't know. God did not reveal it to us. And if God did not reveal it to us, we shouldn't be delving into speculation. But there are some hints in the Bible about where the devil originated. In Isaiah, the 14th chapter, and Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, in the 14th of Isaiah, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
how art thou cast down to the ground? For thou hast said in thy heart, and then it says five times, I will, putting his will against God's will. Listen to it. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, there came a time somewhere back in eternity when Lucifer, the highest and greatest of all of God's created beings, led a rebellion against God. And it seems that about a third of the angels joined him in the rebellion. They were cast out of heaven. They landed on this earth. And the devil and these fallen angels who have now become demons are active on this planet. They're under judgment. They've been defeated by the cross and the resurrection. They are ultimately going to be cast into hell. But in the meantime, they are active and increasing their activity. Now, the sin of Lucifer was pride. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be the greatest being in all the universe. So he led the rebellion. You say, where did he get this idea? We don't know. How did sin enter his heart? We don't know. Why did God allow him? We don't know. This is wrapped up in the mystery of God. It's wrapped up in the mystery of iniquity. It's something we don't understand. And it'll never be resolved until the battle of Armageddon when our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back followed by thousands of the armies of heaven and he's going to destroy forever the devil and his angels. And we'll be rid on this planet of the greatest plague and the greatest thing that has ever happened to any planet anywhere in the universe. Now the second thing, what about demons? The New Testament makes one thing clear. There's one devil, there are many demons. You remember the story in the fifth chapter of Mark, the man of the Gadarenes? This man was possessed of a devil, many demons. And it had affected his mental, his emotional, and his physical faculties. And he and Jesus held conversation, not with the man, but with the demons. Jesus never talked to the man at all. He talked to the demons. And there are several things about that man that interest me today and are relevant at this hour in America. He was naked. He was a streaker. He was violent. He was violent. And look at the violence in the country. And he wanted, he wanted the demons to be cast, or the demons wanted to be cast into the swine, into the pigs. You see the combination you have here? You have violence, nakedness, self-destruction, and pigs. What do some of the people call the police today? Some of the more violent people. Pigs. Is there a connection? I don't know, but it's quite interesting that this demon-possessed man that Jesus encountered would have all of those things that we're wrestling with today. Now, the origin of demons, as I said a moment ago, is unclear. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, the devil and his angels fight against Michael, the archangel, and his angels. Now you say, what about exorcism? Well, do you know what the word exorcism actually means? The word exorcism means expelling spirits by a religious act or a religious service. That's how what it means, expelling an evil spirit. And Jesus, of course, was the greatest of all exorcists. He commanded the demons and the forces of evil to come out of people. And that man 
that I was telling about a moment ago, he commanded this legion of demons to leave, and they left and went into the swine, and the swine went hurtling into the sea and destroyed themselves. Now, the fact of exorcism is a reality, but it's misunderstood. Some of the modern interpretations originated actually in pagan practices. Magic formulas and rituals to expel evil spirits have been practiced for centuries in primitive societies, usually accompanied by violence and infliction of pain. There's one tribe in India that I read about where they take a cotton wick soaked in oil and they light it and they stuff it up the nostrils of the person who is supposed to be possessed of demons. And the cruelty of professional exorcists in many parts of the world is beyond our comprehension and understanding. Now, Matthew, the eighth chapter, tells us that when the disciples brought to Jesus many that were demon-possessed, he cast out the spirits, not with a long ritual, as we're being told today, but by a word, his word. And his disciples cast out demons, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by a word. The power of the name of Christ. And Mark 16, 17 says, And these signs shall accompany those who have believed in my name. They shall cast out demons. However, there's a warning. Don't go around using some sort of hocus pocus and say, Be gone in the name of Jesus. It won't work. You have got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you have to be walking in the Spirit and you have to know that that's a demon and you have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have the authority of God's Word back of you. Behind the name of Jesus stands the power of Almighty God. Now, how do you keep from being possessed or harassed and vexed by demons? You see, demons have power only, that is, as far as a Christian is concerned, only when you are walking in some sin. If you allow a besetting, besetting sin to get a grip on you, you've opened the way for the demons in your life. As we walk with Christ, if you're a Christian and you're walking in the Spirit and God is with you, and all known sin has been confessed, and you're in fellowship with Christ, then you can walk in the middle of the most dangerous spiritual situations and be protected by God. You can claim authority over the devil and his angels. But I'll tell you what the devil will do. He'll bluff as far as he can. He'll take all the ground that you give him. Give him an inch, he'll take a foot. A woman possessed of the spirit of divination, you remember, bothered Paul in Philippi. And he said, you evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of this woman and leave her alone. And the evil spirit came out. Now, I personally have had that experience a few times, but very few. And I was trying to think only once in America. I remember twice in India, I remember once in Africa, and once in the Far East, twice in the Far East. And on each occasion, very interestingly, the person involved used the same three words. I am free. Christ can free you. But it's not done with a ritual. It's not done with the way we're, it's being depicted. It's done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every believer, every Christian, has the right to pray that prayer with a person who is in trouble. Now, a great many things that we call demon possession are not demon possession at all. For example, mental problems are not caused by demons. Some may be, but many are not. And so you have to have discernment that only the Holy Spirit can give you as to what is demon activity and what is normal activity or the activity of nature. 
You say, well, how do we overcome demons when they bother us and harass us? I want you to listen to this. First of all, be sure you know Christ. I do not believe that a true believer in Jesus Christ can be possessed by a demon. You can be vexed by a demon. You can be harassed by a demon. But I do not believe the Scripture teaches you can be possessed by a demon. Now, Satan filled Judas. Satan filled Ananias and Sapphira who were professing believers. We're told in Scripture. But are you sure that you know Christ? Do you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? Have you settled it? Come to Christ tonight while you can. As Bill Cepeda said he did five years ago. As Mike said he did three years ago. Come to Christ. Surrender your life to him and make sure about that. And you will have a power living in you that is greater than he that is in the world. You will have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in your life. And you can resist the devil, the Bible says, and he will flee from you. The second thing, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you tonight as a believer, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? You can be filled not through some emotional ecstasy. You can be filled by a simple act of faith. How did you receive Christ? You received him simply by faith. All right, you're filled the same way. You can say, I am filled by the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, by faith. You see, the moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. And as you surrender everything that he points out that's wrong in your life, then he fills you, and you're filled, and you produce fruit. Now, every Christian has the gifts of the Spirit. You have a gift. I don't care who you are and how lowly a Christian you are, you have a gift. And you ought to be utilizing that gift in the body of Christ, and you ought to be utilizing that gift in witnessing for Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is something different. The fruit of the Spirit is different than the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit. Love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. That's produced by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are living in the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, Satan cannot get inside of you at all. But let me tell you, sin, even the slightest little sin, will grieve the Holy Spirit and open the way for demonic activity. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor desert you. I will not forsake you. Now, the third thing, watch for the schemes of the devil. The Scripture says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, the devil is going to exploit your personality quirks, the lust of the flesh, the natural physical drives that you have, hunger, as he did Jesus. He tempted Jesus when Jesus was hungry. The devil always comes to you when you're weak to tempt you, to harass you, to trouble you. Watch out for those moments when you're weak, when you're hungry. He also uses the sex drive Sex is a powerful drive that we all have and the devil will use it if we give him a half an inch. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God that ye may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And then the Bible outlines the armor that we should have. And I want to ask you tonight if you have your armor on. Have you checked it? First, check it. The belt. Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. Now, 
the belt or the, gir or the girdle was a belt about six or seven inches wide that went around a Roman soldier. And by the way, when Paul was writing this in Ephesians, he was in a Roman jail and a Roman guard was guarding him, so he just looked at his uniform and got his illustrations for how we Christians ought to be. And one was that belt, because you see, that belt or that girdle held everything else in place. And Paul says, have your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the Scriptures. Learn the Word of God. That's the reason when people come forward to receive Christ, we give them a Bible study and we get them involved in the Scriptures, reading the Scriptures, memorizing the Scriptures. This is how we resist the devil. When Jesus Christ was tempted of the devil, what did he do, argue with the devil? No. He resisted the devil by quoting Scripture. That's all he did, just quote Scripture. He said, it is written. And when he was finished quoting the Scripture, the devil would leave him, and angels would come and minister to him. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. So you need a righteousness that has been provided for you and it was provided for you by Jesus Christ on the cross. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness so that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, how about your boots? Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now that doesn't mean to go out and just preach the gospel. It means more than that. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. You see, Satan uses worry, anxiety, and tension to keep us off balance. Are you afraid? Do not fear, for I am with you, says God. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will uphold you with my right hand, says God in Isaiah 41. Are you worried about inflation? Everybody is. Bills are stacking up. Pressures of business closing in. Children getting out of hand. Are those are the things you're worried about? The Scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all comprehension will guard, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then fourthly, what about the shield? The Roman soldiers carried a shield. The Scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Now, Romans' shield was two feet wide and four feet long, and it warded off the blows of the enemy. He would hide behind it when, Rome, when arrows would come against him. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Trusting, believing in God, taking God at his word. And then fifthly, there's the helmet. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet is very important because it guards the brain, protected the head. There's a lot in the scripture to say about the mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit, and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith, and you put on the helmet, and that helmet protects you against the enemy. The devil is going to try to cause you to doubt. He's going to try to cause you to question. I remember my own father. He had been told by a preacher many years ago that he'd committed the unpardonable sin, and my father thought all those years that he couldn't come to Christ. He hadn't committed it. He didn't even know what it was. 
And it was years later that he found the joy of his salvation again. You see, Satan had sidetracked and perverted the Scriptures. And then there's the sword and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. You see, our Roman's blade was about 24 inches long, and he would twist and turn, keep his balance always, thrusting. And the Scripture says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to study the Bible, to know the Bible, to learn the Bible. And I believe this. I believe that Christians and believers are going to go through a period of trouble and difficulty. We may go to jail. We may be killed for our faith, as many people in other parts of the world have been. We're not going to escape. It's on the way. And the way to get prepared is to learn this book so that when they do call upon you to witness, when they do call upon you, you know the Scriptures. And you can quote the Word of God and be a witness and resist the devil. And the Scripture says he will flee. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Praying and Bible study. Check your armor. Is it in place? One final word. The final victory. The devil and his works and death and hell and the grave have been nullified. They've been destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. The victory is won. The victory is assured. Till that final day, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of fighting, a lot of battling, but we're on the winning side. And the Scripture teaches that Jesus Christ has won the victory. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. There's power in the blood.